Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Valuing Nature, a Pathway for Impact Investing. I'm Jen Hawes, Partnership Manager at Island Press. Before we begin today, I'd like to go over some logistics with you. The webinar today will flow as follows. We'll start with a brief introduction from Lee Welton of the Conservation Finance Network. Following that, Bill Gim will conduct his presentation. Then Bill and Peter Stein will have a short fireside chat style conversation amongst themselves. After that, we'll be opening this up to questions from the audience with Peter moderating our discussion with Bill. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation. To do so, please use the questions box in the GoToWebinar panel, which should be at the right side of your screen. If you have any problems, there's a chat box where you can contact the organizers. Following the webinar, you will receive a link to a brief survey. Your feedback is imperative to Island Press and our continued ability to provide free webinars. We ask that you please fill out the survey. This webinar will be recorded and you'll expect to see that within the next week. I'd like to do a brief introduction for you of Island Press. Um, Island Press is an environmental nonprofit book publisher founded in 1984. Our mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment. We elevate voices of change, shine a spotlight on crucial issues, and focus attention on sustainable solutions like we're doing here today. We'll be offering a 30% uh, discount for anyone attending the webinar today using the coupon code uh, webinar at islandpress.org. Uh, to receive Bill's book. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Bill. Um, Bill Ginn is a business strategy consultant who has served in senior leadership positions in both nonprofit organizations and businesses. In 1983, Bill founded Resource Conservation Services, Inc., a business that was listed twice on the Inc. 500 fastest growing companies. Bill sold resource conservation in 1996 and moved for a time to New Zealand, where he worked for the Nature Conservancy's Asia and Pacific program. In 2008, he was appointed TNC's chief conservation officer, and by 2014, he became executive vice president of TNC. While there, Bill founded NatureVest, a partnership with private investors that has brought in over $20 million of investment into conservation problems worldwide. Bill left TNC in 2018 to work on business strategy projects for clients from Maine to India. Peter Stein is the managing director of Lime Timber. He joined the company in 1990 and has led the firm's conservation-oriented forest land investment strategies. Previously, Peter was senior vice president of the Trust for Public Land, where he served, where he was once the founding staff. Peter lectures frequently at graduate schools and professional conferences on conservation investment strategies and structures. He was the co-founder of the Conservation Finance Network and National Land Conservation Network. Peter serves on the Investment Advisory Committee of Spring Point Partners, the Advisory Board of Quantified Ventures and Rose Smart <clears throat> Growth Real Estate Fund and is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Montshire Museum. Uh, Lee Welpton is the Program Director of the Conservation Finance Network. Uh, we are doing this webinar in partnership with the Conservation Finance Network today, so we're very pleased to offer you that. Um, so the Conservation Finance Network uh, works to increase the capacity of practitioners to use innovative or just plain effective funding and financing strategies. Lee was formerly part of the Island Press family where the network was first founded. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lee. Thanks, Jen. Uh, we're really excited for the launch of Valuing Nature today. Uh, it is a veritable anthology of a lot of recent deal-making activity, both here and abroad, and uh, got my copy right here for reference. Uh, one of the things I like most about the volume is its clear descriptions of strategies and examples, uh, examples of where they've been attempted. To be honest, it's the first time I've really understood uh, how a debt for nature swap might work in practice, so there's that. And taking a step back, um, I just wanted to spend two minutes describing the extent to which Island Press's publication of books like Valuing Nature have directly supported the growth of the field, both of conservation finance and conservation investment, uh, not only supporting the growth of my own personal bookshelf and collection. So Valuing Nature follows a prior book 
uh, that Bill wrote and published by Island Press in 2005, Investing in Nature. And that was really part of a wave of foundational literature that first established and defined the practice of conservation finance. Uh, at the time, there really wasn't much out there, not even a Wikipedia definition, for example. And so this and similar titles, um, like Story Clark's A Field Guide to Conservation Finance, like uh, a volume edited by Jim Levitt, Walden to Wall Street, they continue to play um, a pretty important education and inspirational role for practitioners around the world. We certainly use them in our trainings and convenings. But at the time, they also helped contribute to the momentum and support for a fledgling collaborative uh, among leading practitioners in the field, which is now the Conservation Finance Network, the program that I run. Um, and that was founded at Island Press, believe it or not. So though we're now a vibrant community of practice, we're physically and administratively based these days out of the Conservation Fund, we spent our first four years or our startup phase uh, being incubated by the Island Press family. So I'm very thrilled for how full circle this has all come. Uh, I'm thrilled to share the great impact that Island Press has enabled to engage Bill on this webinar, showcasing a phenomenal new book. And uh, I've been describing it as a font of knowledge of sorts in understanding the evolution of conservation deal making over the last decade, if not much longer. So without plagiarizing, uh, for those uh, millennials or otherwise out there, um, don't take my word for it. Uh, not plagiarizing, reading Rainbow there. So Jen, back to you. Great, and with that, I will hand it over to Bill. Okay, hi everybody. I'm just gonna uh, share my desktop here um, so that um, you can see my presentation here. Hold on one second here. Okay, is that showing? Yep. Okay, great. Um, well, listen, uh, thank you uh, everyone for your kind introductions and uh, particularly to the Island Press and to the Conservation Finance Network for, uh, for sponsoring uh, this. You know, actually, you know, writing and talking about things is pretty easy. Um, it's the doing that's hard. And all of you who are doers there, and I've had a chance to look at uh, the names of a lot of people that I recognize uh, from uh, my career as doers, uh, thank you, because you're the people that really have inspired this book and inspire uh, all of us to keep on working uh, on these really important problems. You know, I suspect that uh, there's really no need um, for me to uh, catalog the challenges that the the world faces. You you all know what those uh, what those are, whether it's from climate change to where the future of water is going to uh, come from. I'd rather take a, a sort of a different tact here, um, which is you know perhaps a bold statement uh, on on my part, but I believe we are living in a time of uh, change and evolution that is akin to the industrial revolution 200 years ago just as then uh, we're going to have to completely change um, how we grow our food uh, transport ourselves build our buildings live in our cities address how we use water this is an extraordinary uh, moment in history and it is really a great time to be an investor and an entrepreneur because in these times of change, uh, it favors innovation, it favors new ideas and uh, new solutions. So uh, to be 30 years old again and be embracing and facing uh, all of these extraordinary uh, opportunities. Let me just give you one tiny example, um, which I think is uh, important here. Oops, I can see that no one can see me. Well, I'm turning myself on. Um, there you go. Um, the archaeologists say that um, human beings have been uh, conducting agriculture for about 400,000 years. That's roughly 20,000 generations of farmers who have contributed to 
our current food system here. But all the data suggests that we're going to need to double the amount of food productivity in the next 50 years. So if you think about it, in 50 years, we're gonna to have to do what it took the entire human race, 20,000 generations of farmers to uh, accomplish. That's a huge lot of change. And it's a huge opportunity for people who are interested in the agricultural sector. And I would also say that much of this is gonna be done by the private sector. Uh, the farmers of the world are not employed by government. Um, you know, the seed companies of the world are not government. You know, they're private sector. Um, and so we need to think about this as a partnership with the private sector if we're going to fundamentally change the productivity of our agricultural system and make it more uh, sustainable. Uh, one of my favorite quotes in the book is Dwight Eisenhower who said, you know, farming looks mighty easy when your plow is a pencil and you're a thousand miles from a cornfield. Well, you know, I feel the same way about writing a book in some ways, but certainly uh, advice is cheap. It's execution where the opportunity is. And I'm empowered to know so many of you who are working to solve these kinds of problems and start new businesses and new approaches to uh, that work. Now, let me also say that I know a lot of you are uh, come from a long history of suspicion of the private sector. Uh, and certainly there's good reason for being concerned about the private sector and all the impact it's had on our environment. Um, and I actually start my book with, you know, a list of four or five examples of where the private sector, where markets have gone uh, awry and caused huge challenges and problems. I mean, just because ivory and tuna have a high market value, which they have extraordinary market values, doesn't mean that elephants are being conserved or that tuna is being conserved. Or uh, the rise of the yellow shirt movement in uh, France, you know, we may not fully uh, comprehend it here in North America, but the rise of that movement was because of a decision the Macron government made to start taxing fuel sales in an effort to reduce um, uh, carbon use in their economy. But what they failed to appreciate is how that incentive impacts poor people in fundamental ways. So the private sector has its own challenges, but what I am proposing here is that we build an ecosystem of government policy, of innovation coming from impact investors and from uh, nonprofits and investments from business to create and challenge these activities and create solutions for them. None of those sectors alone can achieve the kind of success that we need. We need all of them to be uh, working together. Now, just a little bit about the organization of my, my book. Um, the first half of it is um, the seven um, natural asset categories that I think are most exciting and ripe for, um, for in invention and for investment. Um, and then the second half of the book is a toolkit. So uh, how do you think about uh, structuring um, investments? Uh, what are the rules from a regulatory perspective that might uh, impact, say, a nonprofit who's interested in engaging in these uh, sectors? I want to tell you a little bit about and give you a few examples in each of those uh, categories so that you can get a, a, an understanding of what I attempted to do uh, in the book. Um, as one of our uh, previous panelists uh, recognized, uh, in 2005, I wrote a book called Investing in Nature, and that was really about land conservation. And at the time, that was really the main focus of conservation investing. Uh, today, what we've seen is a tremendous growth in the categories of interest from, from water to, of course, climate change um, to agriculture and uh, green infrastructure and the oceans and, and, and beyond. So there's been a tremendous breadth of, uh, of growth in this sector. The Cumberland Forest Project uh, is a nature conservancy project. Um, that um, provided about $120 million worth of capital to buy two critical properties in the Cumberland Forest area of the mid-Atlantic. Mid 
What's interesting about that transaction is that only 5% of the capital came from the Nature Conservancy. 95% of the capital came from either program-related investors like foundations um, who are looking to receive a return, albeit a modest one for their investment, and actual private sector uh, investments creating a partnership. Um, and this is important because as we try to think about how we get to a scale that matters, we need a lot more capital than nonprofits can provide to these kinds of transactions. The other thing that's interesting about this is the intersection between climate change and forest projects. And um, this particular project, almost 50% of the return to investors will come from the sale of carbon credits. That's a huge change from the past um, and a whole new category of valuing nature, valuing nature not just for the products that forests can produce, but for its important role uh, in climate change. Another category that has seen tremendous growth here is investing around water. Uh, I myself can think of at least a billion dollars worth of funds and transactions in uh, North America and in places like Australia around water. It's really one of the fastest growing segments for investing and for good reason. Water is one of the shortest commodities um, in, in nature, fresh water, and uh, we need to treat it far better than we are treating it uh, today. And when you think about water, all roads really lead to agriculture because agriculture uses between 80 and 90% of all the fresh water uh, in the world. So it's about finding ways to invest in ways that agriculture can improve uh, the amount of crops they grow per drop of uh, water. Murray Darling was the first Nature Conservancy water fund. It's um, um, a large watershed in, in Australia. It's one of the first examples of a place where all water rights were formally codified and awarded to farmers, and they are transferable and saleable. So a farmer who makes an investment, say, in improving his irrigation and yields an additional 20 or 30 percent available water can sell that water to his neighbor in order to get the money to pay for the improvement in his irrigation uh, system. And that marketplace also allows us who are interested particularly in natural assets to acquire water and put it back into uh, nature. Similar experiments are happening in, in North America. We of course don't have the kinds of water trading rights and responsibilities that, um, uh, that the Murray Darling Basin has and it's coming, it will happen but over time. And, but interestingly, entrepreneurs are finding ways to work in this space um, and reinvest in ways that are generating a lot more water, improving agricultural outcomes, and that's good for everyone in uh, the system. Another area that I think is particularly uh, interesting that I chronicle in my book is the intersection between green infrastructure and cities. Um, uh, all of us who are stuck at home know how important livable cities are, uh, and, uh, and I think we'll see a lot of uh, keen interest in how we improve the quality of life in cities. And one of those is around green infrastructure. This happens to be a photograph of a neighborhood in Philadelphia that has green roofs and um, has really invested in its uh, green infrastructure. That has a lot of benefits just from a livability perspective that make it worthwhile. Um, but from an investment perspective, um, here's the opportunity. The largest source of pollution flowing into uh, places like the Chesapeake Bay and the Great Lakes and other watersheds is coming from runoff uh, from these urban streets and cities. You can use green infrastructure to solve for that problem. And that allows cities to, instead of spending billions of dollars on concrete plants uh, uh, and, and panels and uh, and technology to instead invest in green infrastructure. This is already spawning millions of dollars worth of investment. I know of several companies that are working in this space uh, now, and there's very exciting opportunities for public-private uh, partnerships. Fishing is another area. The world's oceans obviously are so important. Um, you know, over a billion people in the world uh, depend on fisheries. They're also one of the 
you know, most distressed of all of our natural uh, assets. Uh, there have been wonderful examples of groups like the Cape Cod Fishermen's Trust uh, in New England, the Nature Conservancy's program in California that have been buying fishing rights and doing unusual things with them. When the Nature Conservancy bought all of the uh, significant portion of the rights of the ground fishery off the coast of California, a lot of people expected us to, you know, stop fishing uh, and do a conservation thing. Instead, the Conservancy actually uh, went down a pathway of partnering with the fishing industry to look for new ways to fish sustainably. The theory being that in the long run, um, we need uh, sustainability of our fisheries, and the only way to get there is to transform the private sector. So this is a story that's been going on for the last decade. Uh, what's really interesting is now the Conservancy has almost sold all of its rights back to uh, local community uh, nonprofits who are managing these community assets on behalf of the fishermen in their community. So it's an interesting example of a hybrid of community-owned assets working with the private sector to improve and manage uh, fisheries uh, going uh, forward. In my last assignment at the Nature Conservancy, I, I helped start the India program. And one of the things I was most interested in was the um, challenges around uh, crop burning. Uh, more than a third of all the air pollution in India, which has some horrible air pollution problems, um, comes from the burning of crop residues. Uh, and that does a couple of things. First, it depletes all the organic matter from the soils. This is a worldwide agricultural problem, by the way, depleting organic uh, matter in soils. It also, in some really important ways, um, increases the need for commercial fertilizer um, and uh, it causes all the human health problems that are associated with that. A group of fantastic inventors have put together a machine called the Happy Cedar. Uh, it's a, you know, kind of a wonderful name for, that you'd think of coming out of India, but it's an example of technology that incorporates the crop residue back into the soil uh, and seeds the next crop all in a single pass, doing it highly efficiently and doubling the amount of organic matter going back into the soil, reducing the amount of water needed and reducing the amount of herbicides needed in this crop technique. There are now 15 manufacturers of this equipment, uh, and that's a huge uh, step up. Of course, we have to reach uh, millions of farmers in order to make that uh, transition to a more sustainable agricultural base, so the work is not done. This actually is a really interesting example, I think, of the need for public-private partnerships. We need the policy of the central government focused on uh, ending farmers uh, burning crops. There's nothing cheaper than throwing a match on a field. Um, and as long as those unsustainable, unhealthy practices are possible, um, getting new investment in new solutions is much harder. So we need the partnership of government in this and in so many other cases in order to create the incentives, um, the legal frameworks, that require people to do what they know is right and what's right in the long run, but that needs uh, a, a lot of uh, effort. This is uh, my own personal new venture um, called GoLab. I'm managing director of this uh, company. Um, our thesis is um, that we can make uh, insulation products out of wood fiber. Um, this is actually quite a large market and um, um, and a significant part of the insulation market in Europe, which is much more advanced when it comes to thinking about climate change. Um, and these wood fiber-based insulations can provide a sustainable long-term solution to our building needs. And this is an area that's so important. 32% of all the world's energy is used by buildings, so we must make them high-performing. Yet at the same time, if we go down the pathway of concrete, of steel, of uh, foam insulations made out of uh, hydrocarbons, you know, we are, you know, not moving in the direction of a long-term sustainable uh, solution. Someone told me uh, the other day, if concrete was a country, it would have either the fourth or fifth largest emissions of carbon, because it's such an energy-intensive uh, business. So we well need 
to revisit how we build buildings and try new things. And this is just one example of, uh, of me as an entrepreneur and my colleagues and investors trying to find uh, new solutions uh, for, uh, for that work. As I said, the second part of this book is a toolkit um, for those of you who uh, are either new to the field or are thinking through particular problems that uh, you might face. It covers uh, the legal ramifications of engaging in this work. Um, it gives a case study of uh, the Nature Conservancy's effort to create its um, Nature Vest um, affiliated uh, 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 program. Um, you know, for years we had talked about doing a better job of partnering with the private sector, but by creating a whole separate initiative and branding it separately, we shined a bright light on the opportunity here to invest in partnership. And I'm really pleased to say that uh, NatureVest now has $1.3 billion worth of co-investment from the private sector um, on conservation projects across the world. Projects from Australia to Africa to Asia, and of course, a huge amount of work here in uh, North and South America. So great example of, of, of an effort uh, to formalize this and make this happen. It's not without challenges, uh, and I hope I give you a fairly honest and even evaluation of what those things are. Nonprofits, you know, are not the easiest to work with from a legal and regulatory perspective for, uh, when you try to combine that with investing. By definition, they're not, they're not for profit. Many investors look at nonprofits and they say, well, we love what you do, but are you really incentivized to uh, protect our investments? So there's a lot of work to be done here, but a lot of great nonprofits, um, and some of them are on the list there, are really pioneers in thinking this uh, effort through. So understand the legal pitfalls, understand um, uh, the challenges associated with that. One final comment, and then I'll turn it over to Peter for uh, him to give me some grilling on some things that he wants to talk about that I think are important, is measuring success. You know, we need a lot of honesty uh, and, and humbleness in thinking about uh, the work that we do. Uh, and I think the nonprofit sector in general, certainly the conservation community has struggled with how to really measure um, its, uh, its success uh, here. And there's a lot of old saws in this category. You know, those who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it. You know, you get what you measure, Peter Drucker. Uh, you know, and it's, it really is all true. And we need to do a whole lot better here. So I put together some interesting ideas of how people are thinking about this measurement piece. Uh, and it has to be part of uh, all of our uh, programs. So I think as you look at the book, hopefully you'll find uh, more than 50 examples of deals that people have done, not all successful, some failures, uh, some only partially successful. Um, you know, none of them may be exactly applicable to the things that you're doing, but hopefully there's a toolkit there um, that will allow you to think through these issues uh, and uh, take some new direction. We need the private sector. We need the entrepreneurial energy, the innovation that the private sector uh, can bring. We need the capital. Um, there's not nearly enough capital from the uh, nonprofit sector or even from government. Um, without that work, uh, we will struggle to uh, meet the test. And there are lots of great examples of where this partnership between government uh, and nonprofits and investors is creating change. I, I would point to the evolving solar energy industry, for example. Um, you know, 20 years ago, it was the province of, uh, of uh, do-gooders and rich people who could afford to pay the astronomical prices for uh, their solar collectors. Today, it's cheaper than coal. And that's largely been created by this really interesting partnership between government financial incentives, research from the private sector, and from universities in the private sector, now creating a whole industry that's ready to graduate, if you will, to being a main part of this second industrial revolution that I spoke of uh, at the beginning. So I'm excited about the challenge. I'm excited to be uh, part of this, uh, this industry. 
And I look forward to continuing our dialogue and our conversation uh, about how we can be even more successful in the coming years in creating the kinds of change and investment in solutions and innovation that are going to be required to solve those uh, big challenges. So thanks, and, and over to you, Peter. Are you there, Peter? Yeah, I think I'm here. And you know, I didn't go away. I paid attention to your remarks and Lee's remarks, Bill. And uh, I just want to say how pleased I am to be part of this. Uh, actually, a significant part of my adult life uh, was in a position as a board member, uh, one of the earliest board members and long-term board members of Island Press. Uh, I've also known uh, Bill for slightly more than two decades, I believe. Uh, I we've, both, uh, we've both done uh, transactions together and, uh, and even competed uh, for certain transactions over time. And then I had the unique perspective of being the advisor to the Darstrup Treble Foundation for their very first program related investment that was utilized by TNC and Nature of S for the Cumberland Forest Project that Bill described at the beginning of his talk. Um, my task will be to maybe get a little more detailed and a little more granular in a conversation with Bill for the next 15 or 20 minutes. And then I will probably not be able to get through all the questions that um, you folks who are listening and watching this send in, but I'll try to uh, uh, share a few of those questions uh, with Bill and get his responses. Um, I guess one of the first things I wanted to talk about were uh, touch on some of the necessary kind of ingredients for success and partnerships that, uh, that you view as critical to some of the endeavors that you've worked on. And if we could start first with public agencies, which is really both public policies and public agencies. I'm thinking of the DC stormwater uh, retention requirements, uh, which absent that regulation by the government of the District of Columbia, perhaps there wouldn't have been a market opportunity to pursue distributed green infrastructure in, uh, in the District of Columbia. Uh, the other side of public agency relationships are their critical source of grant money for many of these transactions. So, Bill, if you could just uh, react to the partnerships and collaboration with public agencies a bit. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, everything you said, I totally agree with, Peter. Um, you know, the reality is um, so many of these uh, early stage and evolving uh, projects that you and I have been involved on could not have been successful without great public agency uh, support. Um, so what I said about creating an ecosystem of investors, of government um, that works together to achieve these outcomes is, is incredibly important. I think the, the social sector has done a better job, frankly, than the, the nature sector has been uh, done in getting that kind of, uh, kind of investment. Um, you know, I think about you know the early housing tax credits uh, mechanisms, the community reinvestment acts that drove banks to begin to reinvest, the whole ecosystem of community development finance institutions, for which there really is no other analog to in you know our sector here. Um, you know those are in really important creatures of the the federal government. So. It's subsidy and incentives um, are incredibly important to match the aspirations of impact investors who are prepared to take more risk, um, but are keen to have a stable and effective policy environment. So government can do wonders uh, in order to create that. Now, having said that, we all have to acknowledge that it's a two-edged sword. You know, one of the challenges that we face with moving beyond petroleum, for example, is that we subsidize petroleum by, you know, providing cheap coal leases in Wyoming on government land and, uh, you know, oil extraction on, you know, our waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you know, so these kinds of what I would call perverse incentives are challenging and we have to accept that. So sometimes things like ethanol, which seemed like it had early promise to be a wonderful biofuel, you know, 
uh, has been, you know, a very difficult thing. And it's hard to unravel those incentives once they're established and put it put in place. So we have to be ever vigilant and very thoughtful about uh, how we create those incentives because they do send powerful signals through um, through the world. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned community development finance institutions uh, because I don't think I would know you unless I had previously known your sister who worked at one of those. Uh, so uh, Anna deserves a shout out. Uh, but um, the, uh, the other area that I thought would be interesting to talk about, and, and this is true, and I thought I think you captured it in the Morro Bay example in California, is uh, what I term the social license for conservation. Um, you know, how do you have sort of a credible, authentic relationship with the human communities when you're trying to do natural community conservation? And the fact that uh, the Nature Conservancy did not extinguish the fishing leases, but reallocated them. Uh, uh, and thank goodness for technology so you could determine where boats used to go and now where boats are supposed to go. Um, but you really did provide an opportunity to keep the livelihoods of the families in that community going forward. And I would argue that, you know, uh, as much as I am a fan of wilderness personally, uh, the Cumberland Forest in Virginia and Tennessee and Kentucky are not places where local communities are gonna be initially gigantically enthusiastic about either public land or wilderness uh, management of forest resources. And I think uh, that's a great example of balancing uh, rural economic development and land conservation at, at the appropriate scale. So could you talk a little bit more about engagement with human communities? Yeah, well, it's a great point. And, uh, and, and again, I think uh, it's important to highlight those examples of where, you know, working lands, you know, agriculture, organic matter and soils, you know, those are incredibly important areas for investment. Um, and we don't get there, um, you know, unless we co-invest with farmers, you know, um, you know, we will never move beyond coal in West Virginia until we really have an economic solution for those communities. Um, you know, they're, they're desperate people there that need jobs. Uh, you know, I think there is a real lesson here in the yellow shirt example that I mentioned at the beginning. You know, we have to have policies that support the most vulnerable. It's easy to talk about a carbon tax. It all seems so right, you know, that carbon have value. But then when you really look underneath that and realize that if, you know, you're commuting the Bath Ironworks 150 miles from your farm in, you know, Cornville, uh, you know, when somebody puts a gas tax on you, that costs you 20, 30 bucks a week. Uh, and, you know, that may be, you know, the margin that keeps you and your family, uh, you know, able to move forward. So we, we really need to think about the public policy implications here, or else we're going to be, you know, vulnerable to cheap shots from everybody. Uh, about not caring for people uh, at the expense of, uh, uh, you know, their communities uh, when we protect an area or conserve it or, um, you know, do the work that uh, that is uh, required there. So having the courage to, you know, engage in the working landscape is a challenge because it's so, you know, so many people say, well, I just want that to be protected. I don't want forest harvesting. I don't want, but, you know, when you understand the human systems, that are engaged here, you really have to think uh, through that. I think of one of the early deals that uh, that you know well, the Finch Prime transaction, where we and uh, a group of private partners bought the Finch Prime lands. Um, we ended up conserving those uh, forest lands uh, with a conservation easement and reselling a good chunk of those back out to the private sector to provide furnish to the mill. Why? Because you know the mill employed 500 people. You know. You know, those are jobs that, you know, so much more important than, you know, a job as a, you know, in tourism uh, that's seasonal and doesn't have benefits. So we, we really need to think hard about those economic systems and 
not be afraid uh, to engage. And there will always be people who will, you know, question, you know, whether or not, you know, you've lost your mission to protect only nature. Um, when in fact, you know, nature is only protected as much as people are prepared to make sure that it's protected. So we need people to be part of this equation. Great. Well, um, if we can move uh, away from the U.S. for a second um, and to the Seychelles, which I would love to be visiting at the moment, but uh, as with all of you, we're stuck in our homes or offices. Um, it really uh, goes back to something that happened over 20 years ago, which were the initial debt for nature swaps. Um, and this is sort of debt for nature 2.0. So could could you unpack that a little bit for us? Um, sure. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, it's one of the chapters in my book, thinking about all those things. And, you know, one of the, the sad realities is that these coastal um, communities uh, in the world are some of the most vulnerable to climate change uh, and sea level rise and need to have the most important amount of investment in order to adapt them for the future. Um, and the Seychelles is a good example of uh, where um, it's a country that was heavily encumbered by foreign debt, you know, provided in a, you know, benevolent way to try to support their, you know, economy. Um, but uh, there came an opportunity here to take that foreign debt and find a more creative way uh, to deploy the financial resources that they were using to pay off that debt. Uh, instead of sending it to, you know, rich European countries um, to reinvest in uh, the future of their 76 islands um, that make up the, the Seychelles. So our insight was that we could take these debt um, forgiveness programs, um, which were motivated primarily for humanitarian purposes, and convert them into a tool where a part of the debt forgiveness was a requirement that the countries invest in the kinds of things that they need to do to adapt to climate change. And so, uh, you know, without getting deeply into the financial structure, the whole idea was to convert this debt forgiveness from just a blind forgiveness into a much more strategic forgiveness that redirected those financial resources to uh, sustaining their long-term, uh, uh, you know, place on, on earth and addressing the climate change issues. You can do this for lots of other areas. We have now have this kind of effort underway in places like Kenya around water issues. Um, and uh, there'll be many more examples, I'm sure, uh, going forward. I just saw a recent article um, about uh, China exploring uh, debt forgiveness. Many of the nations that they are engaged with, and particularly in places like Africa, are suffering mightily uh, at this particular moment because of the economic environment and COVID-19. And so, you know, one of my aspirations for all of us is to find a way to bring a broader group of countries besides the U.S. and European countries into this conversation about how we can be highly strategic about uh, transforming um, our investments here in these countries. Well, um, actually, the last work trip I went on before um, the uh, stay-at-home rules uh, and realities uh, stopped that was to be joined with the team uh, that Lee leads at the Conservation Finance Network to do a workshop for the Land Protection Network of the North American Program of the Nature Conservancy. Uh, it made me think a little bit about uh, what you've seen over the last 10 or 15 years in what I would call the training up internally of the Nature Conservancy staff to be both comfortable and adept at harnessing and partnering with private capital. It's, uh, it's obviously the rationale behind NatureVest, but uh, NatureVest is just part of the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Lime Timber has had lots and lots of deals over the years uh, with the Nature Conservancy, and I've certainly seen uh, a change in the skill ability and experiential abilities of TNC staff over that point, period of time. Great question. And um... 
you know, on, on the good days, having the, the power of the Nature Conservancy, its balance sheet, its uh, tremendous reach across the organization, its knowledge of donors and therefore investors uh, is an incredible network. And so trying to untap and unleash that, uh, that capacity was really the, the genius behind uh, the creation of, uh, of, of Nature, Nature Best. But it's also true that most of the people that work for the Nature Conservancy today come from what I would call rather traditional conservation pathways. You know, they weren't investment bankers before they started working for the Nature Conservancy. They didn't go get an MBA, they got a, you know, MS in biology or uh, ecosystem services or the like. So the, the opportunity here really is um, to create a whole new cadre of expertise in the um, conservation community. And that includes certainly the, uh, the Nature Conservancy um, to that's capable of and prepared to execute this. So I see a lot more interest in when I visit business schools and engaged, uh, you know, with, uh, with students that are aspiring here to want to work for organizations like the Nature Conservancy because they feel like the potential power there is an opportunity and their skills can bring new ways of thinking about this work uh, to the fore. So that's a challenge for all nonprofits. And I also think, Peter, that not it's not so easy to pivot, you know, big organizations with thousands of employees uh, to a whole new way of thinking about this work. Um, it's very challenging. And I think at some level, we need new organizations that are gonna have, you know, their own pathway that will be different from the old pathways. Innovation is hard and even the best companies struggle with how to create, you know, new business. I mean, just remember IBM gave Microsoft the kernel for, uh, for Windows because they couldn't imagine how, why anybody would want a PC on their desk when they could have a big mainframe behind them, you know, and uh, Walmart killed the retail sector with their incredibly efficient stores, but they didn't imagine that Amazon, you know, and online delivery would change their world. So there's also a need, I think, for new organizations here, because uh, it's very hard to transform um, organizations that have certain perspectives and history into new organizations. It's worthwhile, it's important, but we need new organizations too. Well, good. Um, well, let me uh, touch on just one more thing because you certainly uh, describe it in your book. Actually, before I do it, I have to, the, the back cover of the book has quotes uh, from a couple of people. And one of them is, I have to tell you this story or tell everybody this story is Pete Burma, uh, who lives in uh, Michigan and Wyoming. And quite literally uh, from Bill's previous book, Investing in Nature, uh, somehow found me and Lime Timber in downtown Hanover, New Hampshire. We don't have a lot of retail customers, like literally wandered in off the street and said, well, he'd read about this transaction that the Nature Conservancy and Trust for Public Land and Society for Protection of New Hampshire Forests had done with Lime Timber in Northern New Hampshire. He'd never heard of anything like this. Uh, you know, uh, could he get involved? He's now been an investor in four of our funds, it's worked out really, really well, but it wouldn't have happened if Bill hadn't written that, that book, so. Um, and you know, but, to me, that's one of the exciting things about impact investing is that you have people like that who, you know, are diverting their personal financial resources to, you know, create change. Uh, and uh, that gives me, you know, that warms my heart when I see people that, that do that and, uh, and he's a great champion and uh, a hero, I think, uh, in, in his own individual way, thinking about this work. So um, I'm going to touch on one more thing, and then we'll go to some of these great questions that people have typed into the question box. And that is uh, maybe not the most interesting thing in the world to everybody who's listening in, but uh, Lime Timbers had some experience with this. Uh, the Cumberland Forest and some other parts of the Nature Conservancy have had experience with this, uh, which is uh, tapping into what has previously been viewed as sort of a, a gray or conventional public infrastructure fund that every state in the union 
has actually they have two of them, uh, Clean Water Revolving Fund and the Safe Drinking Water Revolving Fund. And could you just touch on that a little bit because you talked about, we both talked about human communities and a credible nexus with water quality and public water supplies seems to me to be a, a growing critical element to landscape scale conservation and use of the state revolving funds in my mind is an indicator of that. Yeah, well, it's a great example. Um, so, you know, I, I guess the general observation would be that there are so many investment funds that have, um, you know, a public purpose. I think about the, you know, pension funds, for example. Um, I think about these clean water revolving funds that were originally designed to, uh, you know, fund wastewater treatment plants. But as we come to understand pollution, we understand that protecting watersheds is just as important as building a treatment plant. And so we've been able to, I think, broaden uh, the uses of some of those really powerful um, mechanisms for, uh, to add to the conservation um, uh, you know, resources that are, that, are, uh, that are out there. And it's really an example of the evolution of thinking about what makes a difference. Um, the wastewater treatment plant is a lovely thing, an important thing, but it doesn't deal with stormwater runoff. You know, you need to conserve watersheds in order to do that. And so the ability to, to pivot to some of these kinds of funding sources uh, adds, I think, a lot of extra value to the conservation community. And, you know, I think the reality is we wouldn't have gotten to yes on those funds in that particular project if it weren't for private investors also being alongside. Because, um, you know, there still is a deep-seated suspicion of what are the objectives of, the, of, say, a group like the Nature Conservancy. You know, are they really going to pay attention to returning, um, you know, their investors' money? Or if there's a choice between, you know, the purest conservation and uh and giving an investor a reasonable return are they always going to go with conservation so you know we, we have uh we have this sort of mixed mission here and it's one of the challenges of trying to mix investment with nonprofit platforms is that your donors trust you to deal with their charitable money but they're a little leery about whether or not you're going to be a good investment manager so creating these kind of hybrid partnerships and that's a great role that you know you Peter have played with your lime timber fund is that you know you are a you know a real investor you manage you know those investors money and you serve as an interface between groups like ours that are focused on you know creating conservation outcomes and your partnership with us has allowed us to really justify to investors that yeah we we understand that this is an investment and not a charitable gift to the nature conservancy and we have to make a reasonable return on your investment if we ever want to see any more money in the future. And that's really the, the thing that we have to keep in mind here. We want to grow billions of dollars worth of investment in this sector. And the only way you're going to attract capital is if you have successes. If you give a good return to investors and they say with confidence, yeah, that project I did with the Nature Conservancy met its financial objectives and I'm prepared to reinvest again. You need to do that or else you'll never get that investment again. Well, uh, I would love um, to just pose a few questions because we're running out of time. Uh, one has to do with, you mentioned, uh, maybe it's at the very beginning, but efforts by the government of China, uh, principally in Africa, perhaps, to uh, pursue some loan forgiveness. Is there anything that you might be able to share or point people to with respect to that? Well, I mean, I've, the news, newspapers were, were full very recently about um, you know, China's uh, efforts to provide support for COVID-19. Uh, and buried in that story was this interesting tidbit about uh, loan forgiveness. Um, I know nothing really more than that, other than to say that um, you know we're we're going to see as China tries to become a world leader and step up uh, to um, you know a new level of engagement, and one might say as the U.S. and other uh, countries 
back down from their historic leadership in some of these categories, we're going to see interesting opportunities. And we need to uh, be um, very focused on how to achieve that. Just sort of an aside to those of you uh, who don't necessarily know the Nature Conservancy, outside of the U.S., the largest single program of the Nature Conservancy is in China. Yep. We have more employees there uh, than any other place other than, you know, uh, the U.S. And so that's just a reflection of uh, the keen interest and uh, engagement on these issues. And there may be some other side benefits. China now has a renewed appreciation for the potential for wildlife trade to cause huge problems for them um, with the news that it's likely that COVID-19 came from wildlife trading. So the government there has announced very strict bans on animal sales. And uh, I think this time they actually mean it. You know, there's been a lot of lip service to ivory, to shark fins, but now I think they get how many trillions of dollars, you know, a failure to address this issue is costing their economy. So we're going to see some really interesting leadership, I think, coming out of countries like China as they fully step up to their global role in the economy. And that's very exciting. And we should really welcome that and encourage it and try to give great examples of how they could do that in a way that it would distinguish their brand and their country. So um, another question that came in has to do with, um, uh, I think the, the party that asked the question was thinking about land trust endowments, but how could land trusts invest in some of uh, these funds or products or uh, uh, financing schemes uh, where they would get both an economic return and a conservation outcome. Uh, needless to say, uh, land trusts have to be prudent investors. Um, but uh, if I, I will uh, offer some some guidance, which is about 20% uh, of the capital that comes into lime timber comes from foundation endowments, uh, the corpus or the principle of a foundation. And I would say half of that fits in a category that we call self-identified impact investors, where they're looking for both an economic return and a conservation or rural community development outcome. And the other half are, I will politely say, agnostic, which um, they're just looking for the financial return. So I think as land trusts begin to do their own due diligence, uh, there are some investment advisors that specialize in impact investing. Uh, for a while, there was a very uh, liquid way to do this with the Nature Conservancy uh, in the form of TNC's conservation notes, but that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but um, I think it's an emerging opportunity that uh, maybe offline uh, through Conservation Finance Network can be explored a little in a little more detail. Yeah, well, there's foundations have really a, a, a now a pretty clear pathway. They have both uh, an agreement that they can make mission-related investments uh, by private letter ruling from the IRS. There always was a question whether foundations' highest obligation was to their mission or to creating a financial return for their um, for their mission. And uh, IRS clarified that and said that foundations no can bias their investments around their mission uh, and do so without threat of uh, losing their foundation status. Program-related investments, yet another category. Sadly, that general advice has not yet been extended to endowments uh, and other similar uh, kinds of mechanisms. So the logical pathway for, say, uh, a land trust who has an endowment to make investments uh, you know, is a little more clouded uh, and not as clear as it is uh, with, with foundations. Um, but uh, still, I think there's room for lots of, uh, of us using our own financial resources to advance, uh, advance this work in, in important ways. Because in the end, I, I'll tell you, one of the deals we, we did um, out, out west, uh, the Nature Conservancy, in order to get that deal done with a private investor, was, was to agree to take the first loss. And what that made the our private investor feel was, oh, okay, look, the Nature Conservancy is really putting their money here. 
you know, before they might not have cared whether or not there was a loss, um, but now they're taking the first loss. Um, so um, we are aligned with them in the use of uh, our capital, and that's important for investors. So there are financial mechanisms and tools that we can use to structure deals that align investors' interests and nonprofits uh, to work. My only caution here would be there's a lot of issues around private benefit, private inurement, trustees also making investments uh, alongside of, of, uh, of nonprofits that could raise questions about impartiality uh, in their fiduciary duty. So there are pitfalls everywhere here. And I devote a whole chapter to thinking about how to navigate that work and a lot of really interesting examples of you know, what I think you can do and what you can't do. Well, um, thank you, Bill. I think uh, we have sort of used up the allotted hour. Again, I wanna thank both Island Press and the Conservation Finance Network for hosting this. I also wanna thank Bill for spending the time and effort and energy in putting down on paper what his day job was for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone for joining us. And Jen, maybe you have a last item to describe? Sorry about that, I was muted. Um, yes, thank you everyone for joining us today. Please do grab Bill's book. It's available now, it's the publication date today, 30% off with the code webinar. You can get it from islandpress.org, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your independent bookstore, anywhere you'd like to buy it. So thank you all for joining. Thank you for the Conservation Finance Network for co-sponsoring this event with us. Thank you to Bill and Peter for the great conversation. We'll have a recording out to you all next week and everyone have a great day. Great. Thanks. Thanks.